Hi, I'm Thomas the Accidental DM, and today I'm going to be doing a playthrough of the solo adventure for new keepers that is found in the uh, starter kit for Call of Cthulhu, uh, which is Alone Against the Flames. Uh, now, it's kind of designed to teach new keepers how to uh, learn the system and all of that, but we're just going to kind of play through as, uh, as anyone who might be interested in enjoying this uh, particular story. Uh, now, included in the um, uh, starter kit are five different pre-made characters. Now, the, the scenario kind of goes you through and kind of teaches you how to kind of build a character, but we're going to kind of skip most of that uh, and just go with one of the pre-made characters that are in the starter kit. So what I've done uh, is I've labeled them each one to five, um, and I'll just roll a d6 minus one to figure out which one I'm going to be playing for this roll through. And so we will be playing uh, the one listed as number two, which in our case then is going to be uh, Keiko Kane. Um, so just some of the basic stats on her. Uh, her name Keiko Kane. Uh, she's a science student, age 21. Uh, she is uh, from Arkham, uh, but originally from uh, San Francisco. Uh, strength 50, con 80, size of 40, dexterity of 50, uh, aptitude 50, education 70, uh, intelligence 60, uh, POW of 60, a movement rate of 9. Uh, she does have 12 hit, hit points. Um, she starts out with, of course, 60 sanity, um, and she has 12 uh, magic points, and of course, it's always helpful, 50 points of luck to start out with. Uh, now, she is interesting in terms of her weapons that she has to start out with, uh, because she has, in addition to be unarmed, uh, she has a silver pen knife, uh, as well as a hockey stick. Uh, so that's a, be a fun one to maybe play around with. All right, so let's just kind of jump right in and get going with it. The sun is high in the sky, a merciless ball of heat. You feel scorched by the time you reach the bus halt in front of Osborne's drugstore. It's a relief to put down your heavy cases and take off your hat for a moment. You fan your face. It has been a long summer here in your hometown, and yet a curiously empty one. You look across the street at the grubby butcher shop, the grocers with its faded awning and the shabby tobacconist. Mistrustful faces glare at you as they pass, eyeing your clothes and luggage. It was your parents' choice to live here, not yours. You were happy down south as a child among Providence's white-walled houses and leafy churchyards. Perhaps this new job in Arkham will supply the change you need. Yet everybody you know in the world lives here. You know nobody in Arkham, not one soul. You ask yourself one last time if you are doing the right thing. The answer is here. None of your supposed friends have come to see you off. You are alone. Whatever challenges in Arkham, it will be a new life and a brave one. A small gray motor coach approaches and rattles to a stop. You put your hat back on and pick up your case. So now we go to 263. Two young men with sullen expressions alight from the coach. One looks you up and down before heading away. The driver also steps down, glancing at you before crossing the road to visit the tobacconist. When he returns, he is rolling a cigarette between his yellowed fingers. He gives it a final twist and examines you as he reaches for his matchbox. He is a thin man in his 50s, dressed in a dark and a stained shirt with the bus company emblem. His eyes are sharp in their dark sockets. Where to? You show him your ticket from Ossipi. From there, you will connect to Rochester and Portsmouth before the coastal line to Newburyport and finally Arkham. You should be able to afford a rail ticket for at least some of the way. Otherwise, this will be the first of many long bus trips. Mm-hmm. The driver scratches the match and lights his cigarette. The end flares as he takes a draw. Then he exhales and gestures to the back of the coach. Luggage wraps up there. Then go to number eight. The driver smokes and watches as you drag your cases to the back of the motor coach. The rack is set conveniently high in the vehicle. You get a grip on the heavier case. So if your size is 40, you go to 23. If your size is higher than this, go to 38. And she has a size of 40. So she goes to number 23. You struggle for a few seconds before the driver comes up beside you and lends a hand, still puffing on his cigarette. Heavy bags for a small one, he remarks. You judge it's best to respond with a simple thanks. Go to 233. The driver flicks his cigarette into a gutter and steps into the motor coach. Its engine coughs into life. You board, grateful that you will be the only passenger for the initial part of your trip, at least. With mixed emotions, you watch from the window as the tired avenues of your old home slip behind you, receding into the distance. For a few minutes, you can see the church spire over the brow of a low hill. Then the road dips, and it too is gone. Arkham is your new home. You will travel there and make a new start. Then go to page 134. The coach putters through the countryside. At first, the interior is stifling. Your stomach lurches with every bend in the road. However, the driver opens his window, and by switching seats, you find a spot where the breeze hits your face. 
You soon relax into the journey, observing the quaint little hamlets that coach serves. A heavyset woman boards at one settlement and gives you a polite nod. She goes, gets off at the next one. The road rises a little, passing cornfields and orchards. The leaves are turning and the trees are alive with glorious reds and golds. You have just begun to doze when the driver takes a tight bend at speed. Now you must make a roll against your decks. Okay. Uh, all right, so 30, uh, score of 50. Uh, so that is, a, that is a success. So if you pass your dex roll, go to 261. A desperate yell awakens you. You feel yourself slide from the seat as the driver spins the wheel and the motor coach plunges off the road. You grab hold of the seat in front of you just in time to prevent a painful fall. The coach stops with a thump. Now you see what happened. A Fordson tractor has stopped in the road and your driver has had to swerve to avoid the still obstacle. He leaps from his seat into the road, unleashing a string of curses at the farmer. You take a moment to catch your breath. Perhaps you should offer assistance, but the driver has already turned. He backs the coach up a little and threads it around the tractor, glaring at the farmer. Go to 71. You resume your journey. The driver takes the curves with more caution than before. He glances over his shoulder at you a couple of times. Sorry about before, he says. That fellow was dumber than a hog. I'm Silas. What's your name? The accident was at least as much Silas's fault as the farmer's, but it doesn't seem shrewd to antagonize the man while he's driving you through the middle of nowhere. The coach turns onto a narrow road, which weaves uphill through woodlands. Silas becomes chatty. Going to Arkham, eh? Can't say I've heard of the place. Went to Boston once. Didn't like it. Too much hustle and bustle. You got family there? A special someone waiting? The afternoon is wearing on. You see no harm in confiding in Silas about your new life. A job, eh? What's your line? As a science student, uh, we will go to a uh, professor on page 265. You explain you are joining the faculty at the renowned Miskatonic University. It's only a junior position with teaching and tutoring duties, but the institution is well regarded. Who knows where the appointment might lead? A symposium, a visiting lectureship, even one of the world's spanning ex expeditions. Hmm. Silas wrinkles his nose. I had enough of book learning when I was a young'un. Still, I suppose it's well enough for those who like it. Then we go to number 128. You realize Silas hasn't made a stop since the incident with the tractor. The motor coach winds its way uphill. However, your thoughts are interrupted as the road crests a ridge and you are treated to a magnificent view of the vista below. A creek snakes through the valley, breaking the rich autumn palette of the tree line. In the distance, the white mountains rise into a hazy cloud. There is no settlement, not even a cabin, as far as the eye can see. Birds drift through the treetops, and you can make out what might be two white-tailed deer lingering by the water. Perhaps you're making a mistake by moving to the city. Could you survive on your own in this lush wilderness? Now go to 144. The motor coach rattles through the hills and Silas laps into silence. The sky darkens behind you. Pinks tinting the clouds as the sun descends. Finally, a welcome sight comes into view, a settlement on the crest of a hill. This doesn't look like the pictures you've seen of Ossipi, but perhaps you can persuade Silas to stop while you can stretch your legs. Minutes later, harsh stuttering from the engine interrupts your reverie. Silas frowns and rattles the gear stick. The motor coach falters in its ascent. Silence utters a curse you don't recognize and grinds his teeth, struggling at the wheel. You seem to inch up the hill until you reach the first building, low dwellings constructed from a rough red stone. Silas wrestles the coach into a small bay off the road. He scrambles from his seat and makes for the engine compartment. We're now given the option of either making a roll against drive auto or psychology. Um, can't think of any necessarily reason why... Um, why um, Kiko would be concerned about psychology, so she'll probably make a drive auto row, um, which for her is 20%. Uh, so we will roll our D100 and see what we get. A 58, and so that is definitely a fail. All right, uh, if you fail your roll, go to 194. Silas opens the engine compartment and sticks his head inside. The hot metal pops and sizzles. He pokes at various components and withdraws and wipes his brow, smearing it with dirt's grease. Ain't sure what's wrong. Might be the oil pressure. Might be something knocked off kilter and we took that spill. Can't do much until the engine cools neither. And with the light failing, I reckon we'll be here through the night. He wipes his hand on a rag. The shadows from your surroundings are already long and the air is chilly. You feel stiff from the journey and a night in the rickety coach sounds unappealing. 
Silence sees your dismay. This here is Emberhead, miles from any place, only come through twice a week, but the folks here are good people. May Ledbetter keeps a spare room. She'll look after you. Up that alley, turn right, first house on the left. He scratches his cheek, looks again into the engine compartment, and spits on the ground. Meet me back here at 8 in the morning, and we'll see how we stand. All right, we're given three options to look for May Letbetter's house, to ask Silas where he will spend the night, uh, to challenge Silas about the breakdown. Uh, again, uh, don't really have any reason to question Silas about his breakdown. Um, and uh, considering, um, uh, considering the character, I think at this time period, she would probably go and seek out, um, and she has no idea that there might be anything uh, untoward. So she would go seek out May Ledbetter's house. Um, and so we go to page 267. You drag your case between the sullen buildings. You feel surprisingly weary, considering you haven't spent all day sitting down. Silas's directions lead to a modest dwelling with a slat roof. A nameplate reads Ledbetter, and underneath a sign in neat copper, he copper plate reads Lodging Room. The lane around you is gloomy, but a lamp flickers in the window. A breeze chills your face. You're not about to begin your new life by sleeping in the streets. You rap on the weather-beaten door. Go to number four. After a moment, you hear footsteps inside the house. A bolt is drawn, and the wooden door swings open. A figure with loose curls and a rough-looking house dress peers at you. A gaze takes in your traveling suit and your case. Her voice has a slight Irish lilt. Hello, should I take it you're looking for a room for the night? You inquire as to her rate, suppressing a grimace. As far as you've seen, the village does not offer you many alternatives. Oh, you'll find them very reasonable, she says. You look tired. I may come inside and we'll talk over a cup of tea. Ledbetter's house feels cramped with a low ceiling and simple fittings, but it is well kept and a cheerful fire crackles in the grate. The aroma of the tea is soothing and the cup warms your fingers. Have you come to Emberhead for the festival? asks May. To explain what happens with Silas in the coach is one of her options, or to ask about the festival. Um, I think she'd ask about the festival, so we'll go to 21. Well, now, I suppose the festival is about the only reason folks come to Emberhead. I thought you have maybe come study or take study it or take some photographs. Perhaps it's not tomorrow night, but the night after. I suppose it looks very strange to a passerby. May tops up your tea. The spout chinks against your cup. We've got the beacon, you see. One night every year there's a torchlight procession and we light the beacon on the cliffs. You never seen the like of it. They say it keeps the spirits of the village alive for another year. It's a celebration, a celebration. She trails off for a moment and blinks. But you didn't come here to listen to me blather, and you must be hungry. I can rustle up a bit of stool. How would that be? You ask a bit about her rates, and May names a price so low you accept it without hesitation. The room is small but comfortable, and the stew dark and hearty. After dinner, you have a couple of hours before your usual bedtime. Our choices are we can talk to May some more, uh, we can go and walk around and get our bearings, or we can turn in early for the night. Uh, as a student of science, I think, I think that uh, Kiko is probably someone who's kind of interested in things, and so she's going to do a little bit of walking around. And so we go then to number 75. May's brow creases when you announce her intention to take a stroll. Mind how you go, she says. Emberhead's surrounded by cliffs and we don't have your fancy street lamps here. Take the lantern and watch your step. Outside you see what she means. The sky is overcast and only a few glimmers of moonlight peek from the clouds. Without the heavy lantern, you'll be walking in near total darkness. You cannot hope to get an overview of the village tonight. May Street is a narrow passage hemmed in by a squat dark buildings. At the end, however, it, it opens up. A wide thoroughfare leads off to your right. A crude sign names it Silsbury Street. To the left, a few yards away, your light picks up, uh, your light picks out the crooked post of a simple fence, and beyond that, the ground drops away into darkness. You take a couple of steps closer, but you can see nothing. Air from below cools your face. Then some instinct makes you look around. Go to 86. An ink-black figure stands in the road about 20 yards behind you. It stares at you. You form the sudden impression that it will run at you and throw you over the cliff edge. This is unsettling. Seeing it has spotted you, the figure slips down an alley. You can either return to the safety of the Ledbetter house or go to confront the dark figure. What would Kiko do? As a student, 
she is a bit intrigued about what's going on, though she is a bit scared from the uh, encounter as well so far at this point, and her fear that the creature or the entity, the person, would be wanting to throw her off the cliff. So which would she choose? I think she's going to go and confront the dark creature, the dark figure. So we go to 121. She's curious. And she always has her knife pen with her, too. As you approach, the figure takes a pace back, then another. It slips down an alley between the two buildings. So we can either try to track it. So we'll need to do a track roll. So we will roll a D100. And our track is probably going to be a fail of a 10%, so it is definitely a fail. So if we fail, we go to number 130. The figure moves fast with almost silent steps. You are hampered with a heavy lantern in an unfamiliar environment. You emerge from the alley in a dusty courtyard. You can detect no signs of your quarry. You scratch around for a few minutes, but the figure is gone. It seems unwise to continue your stroll through the unknown, dark streets while this threatening presence is abroad. You head back to the Ledbetter house. May lets you in and settles back in her chair. Soon she begins to yawn. I believe I'll turn in. What would you like for breakfast? So we go now to 63. As May stands, you hear a clunk behind you. You look over your shoulder, but all you can see is a wooden door securely closed. May tuts, the young lady of the house should have been listening to us. Ruth, come and greet our guest. There's a short pause, and the door creaks open. Two wild eyes peer at you from the gap, between tousled hair and a rough nightgown. What do you say? Pleased to meet you, the eyes blink. Now get back to bed. The door closes again. My daughter Ruth, ten years this summer. She's a delight in a torment all in one. Don't worry, she'll sleep in with me. She'll not disturb you. Good night now. You retire to your room. It's a little chilly, but you are too tired to worry about the light lighting the fire. The sheets are clean. The bed soon warms up. The silence outside is strange. After living in a town for so long, you soon drop off. Now go to 154. You dream of fire in the grate. Coruscating colors shimmering through the dancing tongues of flame. At first, they are tiny, almost microscopic, but they grow and grow until kaleidoscope inferno spills from the fireplace, spreading across the floor up the sheets. You wake up with a start. Daylight glints, glints through the curtains. You get up and examine the grate, blinking the sleep from your eyes. It's quite cold. Now we go to 166. May seems to have no running water but has supplied some in a ceramic jug. You freshen up the washstand and go in. She cooks a hearty breakfast and leaves you in peace to eat. At about 7.30, you are paid up, packed and ready to go. You bid May goodbye, and she wishes you the best for your new career in Arkham. So we're left with a option of if we had succeeded at a skill roll last night, um, we go one place uh, and wish to investigate further. Otherwise, we go to 192. So we will go to 192. You're already tired of your heavy bags. Hopefully Silas has repaired the motor coach and you can resume your long journey. A sour puss he might be, but the old driver seems to understand his vehicle well enough. You pause to check your watch, still 20 minutes early, and round the final quarter. The motor coach is gone. You put your bags down and search the area, trekking up and down slopes and around corners at the edge of the village. You are traced the long road back as it winds across the hills. Eight o'clock comes and goes. There is no coach to be seen. A passing villager notices your bag. Looking for the bus. I had him take off at first light. He's due back in three or four days. If you need a place to stay, mate, let better rent a room. The man raises his hat to you and strolls off into the village. Curse Silas under your breath. Perhaps he went for parts. You wonder if the old goat has stranded you here on purpose. Go to 218. May is doing laundry and looks surprised to see you again. Forgot something. When you explain the situation, she offers to store your bags while you try to arrange alternative transport. You're grateful to relinquish the load. Nobody here has anything like a car. She strokes her chin and narrows her eyes. Maybe you could find someone with a horse and a car for your bags. I could ask around later. Try Mr. Winters at the village hall. You'll know if anyone will. Or ask among the artisans their workshops are first left on Salisbury Street. She reaches over and squeezes your wrist. Don't worry, dear. I won't see you sleeping in the street, money or no money. You thank May and... Turn to face the village. Go to six. You wander through the streets of Emberhead without any particular destination in mind. The village is built on a relatively flat upland with splendid views, 
To the north, the haze of the tips of the white mountains reach for the heavens. To the south, the sparkling waters of Lake Winnipesaukee torch the horizon. The village itself takes less than five minutes to cross from one edge to edge. You arrive in the winding road to the west. The only other road leaves to the south, following a lower ridge of land as it turns east. In the southwest of the village, an open, grassy space borders a ruined church, its graveyard cresting the cliffs. To the northeast, the three main thoroughfares meet a raised black metal structure. It looms stark against the blue sky. Our options are ask about transport at the local general store, seek out the village hall, walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road, examine the metal structure, explore the church, or look for local people with their own transport uh, needs. Well, she definitely wants to uh, get down to Arkham, and so she will choose the first one, ask about transport at the local general store. That seems to be, uh, that seems a logical idea. So we go to 16. The general store is on a corner beside the main road, just before it plunges to the south. The shopkeeper is a brisk, immense lady with a starched apron and strong shoulders. She looks hard at your unfamiliar face. Transport. As a motor coach comes through twice a week, missed it. Hmm. Truck brings in my supplies every second Tuesday, but he's not due until next week, she shrugs. Seems Emberhead is content to keep his distance from the outside world. So while we're here, uh, Kiko will buy just a couple little things to kind of snack on and have something to drink so she has something to uh, kind of occupy her time as she tries to figure out what next to do. So now we go to 25. You're beginning to get your bearings in Emberhead. Would you like to explore some more? Our options are uh, seek out the village hall, walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road, examine the large metal structure, explore the church, or look for local people with their own transport needs. She's still very much wanting to find a way to Arkham. Um, and so of those choices, uh, she will probably go for look for local people with their own transport needs or seek out the village hall as a possibility. I think she would go to the village hall first because she's not too... Um, well-known in the city, uh, so it might be best to seek out uh, an official. So we go to 84. The village hall backs against a cliff at the east end of Silsbury Street. It's the largest building you've seen so far in Emberhead. It is, however, locked and shuttered. You walk around it, through the gaps in the shutters. There seems to be one large room, presumably for community meetings, and a smaller annex that serves as an office and an archive. One of the windows is bricked up. Back at the main door, you can see no posted opening hours. Mr. Winters doesn't open up mornings this time of year, says a gray guard woman passing by. Best come back this afternoon. You ask whether the office has a telegraph. Don't know, she shrugs. Who would we call? You'll have to try again later. Go to 25. You're beginning to get your bearings in Emberhead. Would you like to explore some more? Uh, she's still wanting to try some transport, so let's look for some local people with their own transport needs at this point, and so we'll go to 96. Not far from the Ledbetter House, on the north side of Silsbury Street, there is an open courtyard. The rhythmic tattoo of a hammer seems to announce your approach. The courtyard, in the busiest location you have seen yet in Emberhead, it is bordered by a ring of workshops. Some are brick buildings, some only rough huts. A blacksmith ceases to hammer, thrusting something red and glowing into the bucket of cold water. A weaver looks up from his loom, blinking at you from a moment before returning to his shuttle. A potter engraver and a carpenter each work in their own space exchanging friendly banter you move among the artisans chatting about their work eventually you bring up the question of export some of them send occasional packages with silas some restrict their customs entirely to villagers you receive no suggestions about alternative transport we can make a psychology roll so we'll roll for psychology get a 35 that might be a success let's see what our psychology is Oh, okay, it's a psychology of 30. I think I'll go ahead and push that rule to make it a success. So that will, uh, that will, lower, then our, that will lower then our luck uh, by five points. So we go from 50 down to 45. One of the workshops is shut up. When you stray close to it, the repartee between the craftspeople becomes awkward, almost forced. Interesting. Now go to 25. Back to the beginning, getting our bearings in Emberhead. What haven't we done yet? We've gone to the general store. We've gone to the village hall. All right. Uh, we've 
have, okay, so we haven't walked down the lower level and checked out the Eastern Road yet. We haven't gone to the large metal structure. We haven't explored the church. I think Kiko will probably walk down the lower level and check out the Eastern Road. Maybe there's some transport down there, a passing car, or anything. 115. The air is fresh and the walk down the lower ridge invigorating. You notice cultivated fields stretching through the lowlands around Emberhead and among the crops, some livestock, but no horses. You're going to have to make your onward journey on foot. Further down the road, skirts the edge of the ridge and descends. There are a few scattered hovels here with signs of habitation. They are, they are set a substantial distance apart. As you examine them, a door opens and an older man steps out. He wears a bedraggled suit, but carries a piece of cloth, which he tosses over his head like a hood. As he does this, he sees you and freezes. Make a luck roll. All right. We did just lower our luck to succeed on the psychology roll, so we'll see where we get. We get an 87. Pretty sure that is going to be a fail. Uh, psychology, psychology. Uh, it was a 10. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, is a, is, a, is a 30. So yes, definitely an 87 is going to be a fail. Um, so then we go to, on a fail, turn to 135. The strange man breaks into a run, fleeing from you along the ridge. His gait is lopsided, but his movements have a manacle intensity. If you give chase, turn to 150. You have better things to do to turn to 160. This is a bit strange. I think she is going to follow. Find out what, what's going on here. So she'll go to 150. You break from the road and pursue the man, feeling wild grass snatch at your feet. He sprints around the ridge, attempting to elude you behind the very rocks that support the metal structure high above. Okay, to catch the man, you must make an oppose roll with your dex versus his. The man dex has 38. Okay, um, so uh, what is my dex? My dex is a 50, so we will roll a d100. And 85, that is definitely going to be a fail, regardless of his dex. Um, So we'll roll for him, just to make sure it's not a fail as well. He rolls a 34, which is a regular success for him because he has a dex of 38. So if you win the opposed skill roll, they'll go 172. If you lose the opposed skill roll, go to 87. So we are off to 87. You round an outcrop to find the man has disappeared. The red extends much further to the west, and the outer edge leads to a dangerous drop. You have lost him. So we can make a spot hidden roll. So let's go ahead and roll our D100 and see if we get that. That is a critical success. Why couldn't I got that earlier? <laughs> okay. Um, so if you make a spot hidden roll, if you succeed, go to 181. Unfortunately, that critical success is going to be wasted at this point, but we will go to 181. Almost by accident, you discover a channel between two rocks that leads into the cliff face. The daylight is just enough to pick out a recessed chamber the man crouched there in silence, glaring at you. Damn you, he snarls. Haven't I been tormented enough? However, he seems a little calmer. We can either enter his refuge, or we can not risk it. Let's approach him. So we want to turn to 191. With wary steps, you squeeze between rock out rocky outcrops and enter the concealed chamber, almost banging your head on the low ceiling. The man settles back against the wall and watches you until you draw close. Then he slides back his hood. Make a sanity roll. So we will roll a d100 and we get an eight. Excellent. So that is definitely going to be a success. Uh, if you fail, lose one sanity, which we did not. So then we go to 199. Some of the man's face remains. A strip from the side of his jaw to his right eye socket is healthy and pale if aged but the left side is consumed by angry scar tissue. One eye droops, hooded by melted flesh, and the nostril on the left side is pulled open to leave a gaping hole. The disfigured man studies your reaction with his one good eye. Name's Abragast, Willard Abragast. Guess I don't need to ask what brings you to Amberhead. If you claim to, come, to have come for the festival, we go one place. If you admit that Silas has stranded you here, you go to 214. Though she did pass her sanity roll, this is a stranger who is kind of running from her, so I don't know if she wants to give off her entire business as having been left behind by Silas. So she's going to claim to have come for the festival, so we would go to 206. The swollen mouth gives a little twist upwards. Yeah. Where do you hear about it? 
says some, you say something vague about an article in the newspaper. Newspapers must have changed since last time I'd read one. There's something in his tone you don't like much. Go to 221. Abergas fixes you with a lopsided yet intense stare. You seek me out, eh? He looks up at the cave ceiling. Which one of them told you about me? Never mind, it doesn't matter. Truth is the fear of what I know. They'd never come at me direct. Don't want to end up like old Abergas, he giggles. High-pitched sounds all the more grotesque coming from those bloated lips. Then abruptly his gaze, gaze turns to iron. Emberhead died forty years ago, shattered by flame, consumed by the stars themselves. The ancient hill was cleansed by inferno, and from the blackened ground came new life, as it is the way of all things. The Abenaki knew. Abergas wipes his nose on his sleeve, except none of that happened. The flames were turned away. The necessary death postponed a year and a year again. And now those up there, he stabs a scrawny finger at the ceiling, think themselves saviors of the village, think they can defy the great old ones. Yakuthuga, he shakes his head. With strange aeons, their lives matter less than the blink of an eye. A fierce intelligence burns in his gaze. But you suspect Abergas might be quite insane. If his mood changed, it would not be difficult for him to seize one of the loose rocks and crack your skull with it. To ask Abergas about the Apenaki turned to one two two seven. To ask him about the great old ones. To ask him about the villagers, or to leave while you still can. I think she will ca cautiously ask about the villagers. So we turn then to two forty five. Abergas' face twists, creasing the scarred cheek. <laughs> Their fathers and mothers knew the truth. They listened. They knew their doom and found their place within it. They looked into their own hearts and did the unspeakable. The current brood have the arrogance of children. Everything has been given to them, and they assume it always will. He glares at the cave ceiling. They would that I left or died. I took the old words with me. But mark what I say. Those who live in high places have further to fall. Abergas runs a hand through his hair. A wide strip is missing on the left side, displaced by scar tissue. He climbs to his feet. Go to 259. Abergas pauses in the shadows. There's nothing about you. There's something about you. Something the previous ones never had. Perhaps you can make it through. If you want to hear more, meet me again after dark, nine o'clock, at the graveyard on the other side. He lifts a gnarled finger. Don't be followed, else I won't be there. This ain't the time of year for a showdown. Abergas wipes his nose on his sleeve again. Go now. Your eyes are on me, and stranger, don't try to run. You'll never make it. You emerge in the sunlight, blinking and more than a little shaken. You've discovered a secret. Later tonight, the text will offer you a chance to follow up on a previous appointment. At that point, if you want to meet with Abergas again, add 20 to your current entry number and go to that new entry. For now, go to 160. And that is where we'll end this first session. Thanks for watching along, and we'll hopefully be able to continue this uh, story uh, in the very near future. I'm the Accidental DM. Thanks for coming along.